Welcome to our whiteboard drawing, Enterprise 20, Dial Plan Build, Incoming Call Handling, Part 2. Incoming calling party settings are used to make sure the answer to the question, can my users return calls from their missed and received call lists, is yes. If you don't do anything, then users will not be able to one-click dial from call lists. We hate edit dial, and so do our users. They complain about this. It's simple to fix this for most calls. Let's see how this should work. We'll place calls to the Toronto 55 site from the Toronto 55 test phone lines 2, 3, 5, and 6. Lines on the test phones indicate the number that needs to be dialed to reach them from the corresponding site. When calling into the Toronto 55 site from these lines, the calling party number will be set accordingly. Here's an incoming call with a seven-digit calling party number. Place this call from line two of the test phone. Notice the caller ID on the Toronto site phone. Here's an incoming call with a 10-digit calling party number. Place this call from line three of the test phone. Notice the caller ID on the Toronto site phone. Now we have an incoming call with an 11-digit calling party number. Place this call from line 5 of the test phone. Notice the caller ID on the Toronto site phone. Here we have an incoming call with an international calling party number. Place this call from line 6 of the test phone. Note the caller ID on the Toronto site phone. Look in the missed call list on the Toronto 55 site phone. All the numbers in the call list can be dialed. How did we fix caller ID so that users can return calls with one-click dialing from the call lists? Gateways and trunks have incoming calling party settings for different number types. Type of number is an ISDN feature. You get type of number, TON, from ISDN gateways and H323 trunks and gateways, but not from SIP trunks. We can also fix caller ID for SIP trunks using E.164 addressing. There are four different number types. National number. Users would normally dial one, but the number is sent as 10 digits without the one. For example, 416-555-1212. Then international number. An international number usually without the 011. For example, 4465-712. Unknown number. You don't have a PRI or your PRI doesn't know the type of number. And subscriber number. The number is a seven digit local number without the one and without the local area code. For example, 555-1212. It can also be a 10 digit local number without the one. Your gateway or trunk may behave differently. You need to know how your service provider sends these digits. Unknown number works where there is no ISDN type of number. For example, for a SIP trunk. Each type of number has a prefix you can configure. There's more that you can configure, but we'll just worry about the prefix for now. You can figure the prefix for each number type based on the specific behavior of your ISDN gateway or H.323 trunk. Different service providers do different things. You may need to run some debugs on the gateway, debug ISDN Q931, or trace some calls to determine the correct prefix. The multi-site PSTN simulation uses type of number for the Toronto 55 site H.323 trunk. We programmed the multi-site PSTN simulation to illustrate general configuration of incoming calling party settings, not to match the specific behavior of ISDN trunks in Toronto. Set the prefix for national numbers to 91. At the Toronto 55 site, the multi-site PSTN simulation sends and receives national numbers as 10-digit numbers without the 1. Enterprise 20 prefixes incoming calling party numbers of type national with 91. Set the prefix for international numbers to 9011. At the Toronto 55 site, the multi-site PSTN simulation sends and receives international numbers 
without the 011. Enterprise 20 prefixes incoming calling party numbers of type international with 9011. Set the prefix for unknown numbers to 9. At the Toronto 55 site, the multi-site PSTN simulation doesn't send numbers as unknown number. It receives three-digit service codes sent from Enterprise 20 as unknown numbers. Enterprise 20 prefixes incoming calling party numbers of type unknown with 9. And finally, set the prefix for subscriber numbers to 9. The multi-site PSTN simulation sends and receives subscriber numbers as 7 or 10 digit numbers. Enterprise 20 prefixes incoming calling party numbers of type subscriber with 9. Enterprise 20 sets the prefixes like this for all trunks and gateways unless they use E.164 addressing. Set these values in the gateway device pools. I don't know exactly how my PSTN gateways and trunks behave. What should I do? Set the prefixes like this. This should work in most cases. Set these values in the gateway device pools. If this doesn't work for some gateways, you can fix those as necessary. If you don't know any better, just do this. It's way better than doing nothing. What about SIP trunks that don't support type of number? Enterprise 20 prefixes incoming calling party numbers of type unknown with 9. This should work for local 10-digit numbers. It may or may not work for other numbers. Here's an incoming call on the SIP trunk to the Hamilton 601 site with an international calling party number. We don't prefix 011 because we don't have type of number. This call cannot be returned as is. Users will have to edit dial. We can fix this if we use E.164 addressing on the SIP trunk. What about SIP trunks using E.164 addressing? Enterprise 20 has a SIP trunk at the Toronto site that uses E.164 addresses. With E.164, numbers arrive at the gateway globalized. North American numbers look like this when globalized. International numbers look like this when globalized. Replace the 011 with a plus sign. It's that simple. We have three options. Leave the caller ID as an E.164 number. Users need to get used to this anyway. Localize the E.164 numbers into local formats, 7-digit local, 10-digit local, long distance, and international. Or localize the E.164 numbers into two formats, long distance and international. For each option, we need to consider what the user sees and one-click dialing from call lists. Let's look at the first option. Leave the caller ID as an E.164 number. Users need to get used to this anyway. Users will see numbers that look like this and this. We could argue that users should get used to numbers formatted like this. This is not a problem. However, for users to return calls to E.164 numbers in call lists, we need to implement E.164 routing. Implementing routing for E.164 is not so hard. The problem is implementing E.164 class of service, so users cannot return calls and call lists from international or high-risk numbers if they don't have permission for these calls. We don't want to do this work right now. Let's look at the second option. Localize the E.164 numbers into the local format 7-digit local, 10-digit local, long distance and international. Here are the kinds of numbers and the patterns in call lists that we would need to consider. This option is difficult to implement. Figuring out how to map E.164 incoming calling party numbers onto these patterns is not easy. Also, mapping incoming calling party numbers onto local 7-digit and 10-digit patterns is a bad idea if we consider mobile users. No to this option as well. What about the third option? Localize the E.164 numbers into two formats, long distance and international. We'll see just these two kinds of numbers in call lists formatted as shown. 
This option is easy to implement. Figuring out how to map E.164 incoming calling party numbers onto these two patterns is simple. It doesn't matter if the calling party is local or long distance. Users can return calls to any number in the NAMP with this single pattern. This makes life easier for mobile users. We'll talk about this in a later drawing. Enterprise 20 used calling party transformations for the digit manipulation. For the unknown number type, set strip digits to 1 to get rid of the leading plus sign. Apply calling party transformations using the calling X in E164 calling search space to perform the digit manipulation. We were unsuccessful in getting calling party transformations to work unless we stripped the first digit. Maybe this is documented somewhere. It took us a while to figure it out. Enterprise 20 used the calling X in E164 partition and calling X in E164 calling search space for these patterns. After stripping the plus sign, any number starting with a 1 is an NAMP long distance number, we prefix 9. All other numbers must be international, and so we prefix 9011. We'll talk about global transformations when we talk about outgoing digit manipulation. We still have some class of service issues, but we'll address them when we discuss class of service. This is what the global transformation looks like. And this is the calling search space. Lines 2 and 3 on the Toronto test phone represent local 7-digit and 10-digit numbers. When calling into the Toronto 55 site from these lines across the E.164 SIP trunk, the calling party number will be set to an 11-digit long distance number. Here's what the call looks like on Toronto 55 57001. Here's a call from a local 7-digit number. The caller ID is 9 and the 11-digit long distance number. Here's a call from a local 10-digit number. The caller ID is 9 and the 11-digit long distance number. Caller ID for all NANP numbers is 9 and the 11-digit long distance number. You'll never get this to work 100% of the time. Enterprises can send badly formatted calling party numbers. We've seen 4000 and 0000000. If you don't do anything, then every call from a call list needs to be edit dialed. Nothing works. Focus on getting calling party numbers correct for local and national calls, local and long distance. These are most of your calls. And these are easy to test call from local and long distance phones to the site and look at the call list. It's not hard to find someone to help with these calls. Coming up next, Enterprise 20 Dial Plan Build, Initial Dial Plan Configuration. Thanks for watching.